All right, does DraftKings have mob ties? Yeah, yeah, that, that DraftKings. <laughs> Are they linked to the mob? Well, that's at least what one company is alleging. So we're gonna dive into their claims, look at their evidence, and try to answer the question as to whether, and I can't believe I'm saying this, whether DraftKings is tied to the mob. What's good, y'all? My name is Malik, and this is The Business of Sport, a channel dedicated to none other than, yes, the business of sport. If you're new here, I just wanna give you a huge, huge thank you for taking the time to click on this video, for real. It it really means a lot. I, I put a lot of time, effort, and research into these, so the fact that you cared enough to even click on it, it means the world to me. And yo, if you're interested in stories like this, where we investigate the different aspects of sports business, hit the subscribe button. I, I promise you won't regret it. You probably will but hopefully not until after you subscribe. And for y'all that have been here, my homies, my amigos, my brothers from other mothers, my sisters from other misters, I just wanna say thank you. Your, your boy's almost at 70 subs, yo. 70, 70, that's 70 people. Nah, that, that's, that's wild, man. I, I know it might not seem like much to y'all, but I, I don't even know what to say, dude. That, that, that really means the world to me, for real. Like, it's, I, I just wanna say a huge thank you to each and every single one of y'all, for real. Bro, that, that that's that's so 70 bro that's wild bro that's 70 come on bro oh right, yo let, let's 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 keep going this channel keep hitting that subscribe button hit that thumbs up and yo let's let's make some history all right without further ado let's get to it so all right short sellers are an interesting breed of individuals in a sense that they're kind of a bunch of haters who just happen to do it for a living. They come in all shapes and sizes, but they all have the exact same goal. Find companies that they think are not going to do well and use the many different financial and investment tools and mediums available to them to bet against them in the stock market. Some are more extreme than others. There is a spectrum to short sellers. On, on one end of the spectrum, there's the investor or group of investors who based on some research analysis and maybe a hunch, hypothesize that a stock price of some company is going to be worse than it is today. So they buy some puts with the hopes that their stock price will fall and they'll make some money on the difference. That's fine. I, I don't think anyone really has a problem with that. It, it's definitely not my cup of tea. I, I don't do options trading at all. Uh, I, I don't need another thing to stress about at night, but kudos to y'all that got the stomach for all that. On the other end of the spectrum though, you have hedge funds whose sole purpose is to not just research and find companies that they think are going to do bad, but also find ways to dig up dirt on those companies in hopes of tanking their stock price. To be fair, most of these times, these firms do have some logical reason to short the stock that they're down on. The research to dig up dirt on these companies is more of an addition or a supplement to their initial hypothesis about the company's expected poor performance. And a lot of this research does often expose companies that otherwise would have scammed investors. So there's a lot of good that comes from this. I, I won't lie and say that there isn't. I mean, we've seen this firsthand on a few occasions most recently with Nikola Motors, the quote-unquote Tesla of semi-trucks. It was a firm called Hindenburg Research that exposed some of the fraudulent activity that was going on behind the scenes of this once beloved company. Take for example this video which supposedly shows their truck operating and driving on its own something people have been waiting on for quite a while to see and were becoming skeptical was ever going to happen. So this was huge news to everyone, but especially investors that Nikola had managed to show a hydrogen powered semi-truck that was fully functioning and driving on the road. This means in essence, they could actually build these trucks. But in reality, this truck was actually not functioning at all. And instead this road is actually on a slight decline enough so that the truck was able to just roll down. This truck is honestly just a glorified skateboard or a shopping cart. Hindenburg Research was the hedge fund that exposed this, which they found out by actually visiting the site where they performed this test in the middle of the desert, mind you, to confirm that this was indeed on a downward slope. They've also dug up a ton of other similar situations like this with Nikola, as well as a huge pile of dirt on their founder, Trevor Milton. Kind of scares me that I know his name from memory. And let's just say he had a sketchy past that on some level would have been very relevant to someone looking to invest in a company run by him. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. I don't want to make this a video about Nikola. Rather, I want to use this as an example that sometimes these haters, these hedge funds, 
actually do a really good job of exposing things about companies that otherwise wouldn't be known or available to the everyday investor like me or you. This work by Hindenburg, while yes, I'm sure they made a killing on the stock dropping, but this also benefited the everyday investor by exposing a company that needed to be exposed and was at risk of defrauding a ton of investors. A more recent example of the story is topic of this video, which is about Hindenburg Research's report on DraftKings. The claim here is that DraftKings knowingly operated with and enabled black market gambling operations, including some that, according to some former employees, had ties to plenty of mobs, which is quite the claim. So let's dig into this. Let me hit y'all with a summary of their findings and we can jump into the analysis and try to figure out what is really going on. So the story starts back in 2020 when DraftKings, like almost every other private company at the time, was looking to go public via SPAC. Now, if you're looking for an overview of what a SPAC is, I provide it in this video up here, and I'll also be sure to link it at the end of this video as well. I, it's a good fun, I promise. But as a quick summary, companies who go public via SPAC essentially merge with an existing public company whose sole purpose is to find private companies to take public. In simpler terms, there's a public company that exists, and they don't have any purpose except to merge with a private company who doesn't want to go through the lengthy, tedious, and honestly exhausting process of a traditional IPO. So they combine forces like cereal and milk, or peanut butter and jelly, or me and shitty analogies. So that's what DraftKings did. They actually had a three-way merger with themselves, the SPAC sponsor, as well as a Bulgarian gaming company they purchased called SB Tech. SB Tech was a bit different from DraftKings and their business model. Where DraftKings owned and managed their own gambling product, SB Tech was instead the back end to a few different gambling products across Europe and Asia. So for example, let's say I wanna build my own sports gambling service. Rather than build it up from scratch, I could partner with SB Tech who could provide me with a simple technical solution that I could just plug into my back and infrastructure and enable my gaming site to work. Pretty much in the simplest terms, they sold the motor to the car. And on the surface, this made perfect sense for DraftKings. DraftKings, a US-based company, had limited exposure to foreign markets. They were also just one single gaming platform. If this specific gaming platform died or failed, the entire company was gonna go down with it because that's just what the company is. SB Tech, on the other hand, was kind of the perfect partner to help them diversify. On one hand, they had a ton of exposure to foreign markets. So even if regulators made it more difficult for DraftKings to grow their business in the US, they'd have exposure to entirely different markets where gambling regulations are much more lax. On the other hand, they had a product that diversified them across multiple different gaming products, not just DraftKings. So even if DraftKings was to fail, they were still the main service provider to so many other gambling products across the globe. The other benefit here is that this also enabled DraftKings to own the rails, or their entire stack. Essentially, they were no longer dependent on third parties for their service to run. Or again, in the simplest term, they didn't have to go to anyone else to buy the engine to their car. They now own their own engine. And it didn't hurt that SB Tech was actually a profitable company. In fact, according to Hindenburg Research, SB Tech accounted for 25% of total revenue at the time of this merger. And SB Tech was actually the only positive contributor to operating income providing both financial stability and technology to the deal. Mind you, DraftKings was consistently losing money in the hundreds of millions every year. They still do that today, but this at least helped soften the blow. So all right, this looks like a merger that actually made a lot of sense. So what's the issue? <laughs> and where does the mob come in? Well, I. Let's dig into this a bit more. Hindenburg claims that SB Tech was actually knowingly providing services to both gray and black market gaming organizations. They even go as far as to claim they were operating with groups directly associated with organized crime and money laundering, which we'll get into in a bit. Based on conversations Hindenburg had with multiple former employees, a review of SEC and international filings, as well as an inspection of some of the international gaming websites, they found substantial evidence to show that SB Tech has a long and ongoing record of operating with some unsavory groups and individuals. In fact, Hindenburg estimates that roughly 50% of SB Tech's revenue continues to come from the black market. The firm also claims that prior to the SPAC merger, SB Tech knowingly made a concerted effort to distance itself from its black market dealings, such that it moved any black market or illicit customers over into a newly formed distributor called CoreTech, with roughly 50 SB Tech employees who were just shifted over to this new entity. And the people running this new subsidiary, Cortec, were actually pretty shady as well. The CEO who was selected to run Cortec was formerly an executive of a different gambling firm that was raided by the FBI and subsequently charged by the SEC for deceiving US investors out of over $100 million. So yeah, a sketchy individual 
running this very sketchy subsidiary. Now, okay, the main claim here is that DraftKings merged with a company who was knowingly working with illicit or black market customers and tried to hide it prior to going public by essentially splitting SB Tech into two companies. One for the legal customers, SB Tech, and another for their illegal customers, Cortec. Now, when we say black market customers or illegal customers, what this actually means is that they sold their services to betting sites that were operating in countries that haven't legalized gambling. And as it turns out, some of these sites may have actually been run by some unsavory people. And some of them do have some sketchy connections to, well, some not good organizations. These organizations ran gambling sites that operated in countries like China, Vietnam, Iran, and Thailand, four places where gambling is very, 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 very illegal. Very illegal. Thai authorities in early 2021 raided an alleged illegal gambling operation ran out of four converted shipping containers. The operators administered four websites facilitating Thai gambling, including a site called Betway 88. Authorities arrested 34 people in connection with this raid. That site, Betway88, was found using SB Tech solutions to operate their gambling site. SB Tech was also tied to an Asian operator called 12Bet that was recently linked to a police raid in Vietnam and is suspected to be owned by a triad gang kingpin. Hindenburg also found multiple Chinese facing gambling sites that were also supported by SB Tech's technologies. And here's the kicker as it turns out, one of those Chinese gambling sites called 10Bet was actually started by the former CEO of SB Tech. So, all right, yeah, I, I, I just hit y'all with a lot. <laughs> I, I think we got a couple questions to answer. First, did DraftKings merge with a company that owns a subsidiary that's knowingly working with some unsavory people that may have some mob or gang ties? Yeah, I, I think at least based on this evidence, it's kind of hard to dispute it. But does this mean DraftKings is directly working with the mob? And and that's that's a hard one to answer, and, and I'm a bit hesitant on that as well, because there are some degrees of separation here. I think it's a bit hard to claim that DraftKings has no knowledge of this, when by Hindenburg's estimates, 50% of SB Tech's revenue comes from this subsidiary dealing with these unsavory individuals. That said, there aren't any explicit ties to DraftKings and these unsavory individuals, except that they merge with this company, SB Tech, who, to be fair, up until recently had done a really good job of keeping these illegal operations under wraps. In fact, in early 2020, they managed to also sneak all this by a group of Oregon regulators in order to win a contract to help build some of the state's lottery programs. So if they managed to fool regulators, who's to say they couldn't sneak this past DraftKings? I, I know, it's, it's not a strong argument, but I'm trying. There's also the argument that SB Tech isn't actually all that important to the revenue stream to DraftKings. Credit Suisse, an investment bank that has an outperform rating for DraftKings stock, issued a research note saying that their view is that SB Tech was purchased by DraftKings for its tech platform rather than its existing revenue stream. Said another way, if SB Tech's revenue were to go away, we think there would be minimal impact on the DraftKings stock. So, I guess I'm trying to find a middle ground here. It's very clear that SB Tech had and continues to have a very sketchy portfolio. I, I think it's almost impossible to argue otherwise. But okay, let's take the optimistic approach here because we're not haters. We don't hate on this channel. We, we're not haters out here. So let's assume SB Tech did as good of a job of hiding this illicit behavior from DraftKings as they did Oregon regulators. Let, let's assume that's the case, that uh, DraftKings had no idea that this stuff was going on before they purchased the company. I don't think it was, but remember, we're not haters, so let's be optimists here. If that's the case, and per Credit Suite's analysis, DraftKings only purchased SB Tech for their technology, not their revenues, then what sense is there to continue working with these illegal sites if that wasn't even part of the objective for this merger? Now, again, DraftKings is not a profitable company by any stretch. They lost nearly $400 million dollars last year and that was a number padded by adding in revenues from SB Tech who were profitable. So short term, maybe it made sense for them to look the other way since profits were maybe helping their narrative a bit, which is needed to help the momentum of any new stock, especially SPACs which have the tendency to underperform over the long run. But Long term, I, I just can't see that there's really any benefit here for DraftKings to continue to look the other way, like at all. They're in the red either way. They're losing money with or without them. 
and it looks like the general understanding or the objective of the purchase wasn't anything else but to integrate SB Tech's technology into their own. And analysts like Credit Suisse expect there to be little change in their stock price regardless of whether SB Tech generates revenue or not. Seeing this, I, I really only see two approaches here, and we can call these my optimistic predictions for DraftKings. I don't know if any of this is gonna happen, but this is at least what I think they should do. One, you make SB Tech exclusive to DraftKings cut off any services you provide to any other gaming sites and use that as your competitive advantage in a market where this is much needed, especially in a few years when marketing dollars start to run dry and other means of differentiation are going to become more valuable, especially to investors. Now, I don't think that would be the best approach because that would kind of kill any sort of diversification with SBTAP operating the way that it does now. So that gets us into the second option, which is he just cut off the bad limb and get rid of Cortec, the subsidiary that's working with all these illegal sites. Either way, I just don't see how the risk is worth this slight bump in revenue. I'm not convinced there is any good justification for this by DraftKings. Maybe when SB Tech was a smaller company, sure, you can make the argument that, yo, you gotta get it how you can get it. But for DraftKings, there are already so few differences between all these services. Companies like FanDuel, MGM, and a million others are fighting to be the future platform of sports gambling. But for DraftKings, a company that's fighting with a million other competitors to be the future, if you're truly as invested in that future as these other companies, you should look to eliminate this risk. The last thing you need is bad PR, or worse, regulators breathing down your neck at such a crucial time when so many states are changing their laws around sports gambling. These next few years will decide the future of sports gambling in the US and who gets to be the winning platform. Is the few extra dollars in the short term really worth the risk of compromising the future future of the company in the long term, especially, especially now as scrutiny in this space is continuing to grow. As more and more states open up, more and more people will look under the hood of your company. The longer you wait, the better chance this gets exposed at an even larger scale and potentially incentivize local governments from allowing your service and your service alone from operating in their states. And that, my friends, would be a really shitty way to lose the race. But yo, those are my thoughts. Uh, I'm curious to hear what y'all think. Is DraftKings responsible for SB Tax operations? Is it reasonable to think that they maybe didn't know about all this before the merger? And most importantly, now that this has come out, are they responsible for addressing this? And if so, what actions should they take? Let me know what y'all think in the comments below. All right, y'all, thank y'all so much for making it through another video. If you enjoyed it, please, please, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We're just starting out here and any support we can get is greatly, greatly appreciated. Also, make sure to follow me on my socials, Uncle Malik on Twitter and Malik Mumbai on Instagram. I appreciate y'all, for real. Thank you so much for all the support, all the love, and all the positivity. Have a great rest of your day. Love y'all. Peace. Man, I'm dying, y'all. It's 100 something degrees in Seattle right now. I 100 something degrees in Seattle and I had to turn off my AC so the feedback wouldn't get into the mic. Y'all lucky I'm wearing a dark, you can probably see it on my face, like I'm, I'm pretty sweaty right now, but I'm drenched. I haven't even been recording for like 45 minutes. I'm dying. Also, my snack of the day, Andy's. I got I bought a box of these. Um, y'all know about these? I'm sure y'all y'all seen these. I I don't know. I'm like one of the few people that actually is like a huge fan of, uh, of mint chocolate. That's like one of my things. It's not like one of my things. I wouldn't. I don't know. I like mint chocolate, so I think you should try these. They're pretty fire. You probably have had them before. You were like, ah, oh, these are mediocre. Try them again. Do it for me. Let me know how it tasted. Even if it tastes bad, don't tell me because that'll just break my heart and make me feel insecure about my, my taste in food. Watch these videos.